Um, the plan was actually I was just going out there to be nosy. I wanted to see what, you know, what a protest was looking like because I had called my brother and he said, um, he said they're protesting. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know what a protest was. Well, I knew what it was, but I had never seen one in person. I read about them in school. So um, I, I wanted to see one in person. This is Edward Crawford. On August 11th, 2014, just a few days after 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot and killed by Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri, Edward Crawford went to his first protest. There was a lot of people angry. Um, I, I seen signs... Um, you hear people chanting, using profanity. I mean, they were mad. You know, the the emotion was at an all-time high. It was overwhelming. There were people crying. I don't know if those were relatives or friends of Mike Brown, but it was it was it was different. It was something I never experienced in my life. That's how he described his first day of demonstrations. When he went back out the next night, August twelfth, it was a different story people out there like they were protesting they were angry at the police and the police were angry at the people that were protesting you know so it was like both sides were antagonizing each other and you know the police they were out there to do their jobs but the people you know I guess they were out there to be heard the police at at some point they started lining up with riot gear what did that look like to you is that when things started to seem like scary or or that things were changing? That looked like something you see on a movie. Um, They were very tactical. You know, you can tell that they have been through very prestigious training, you know, like the formation. Even when they move, you know, they move all on one. It seemed like they were, you know, on one beat, if if you, you know, if that's what you call it. I don't know. But um, it was organized. And they were chanting, like, uh, go home. This is not a lawful protest anymore. Please return home. And then there were people saying, like, this is home. This whole scene was well documented in the media at the time. The conflict between protesters and law enforcement reached fever pitch. And when the protesters refused to disperse, the police started firing at the crowd with rubber bullets, wooden pellets, and tear gas canisters. So when they shot the tear gas, it landed... um, it landed fairly close, and the sound of, I don't know, I'm pretty sure you haven't heard tear gas shot. It's a loud, it sounds like a grenade is going off when it's shot. And um, it's, it's, when it's, when it's first shot, it's, it's like real smoky in the sky. And then you can follow the smoke trail, and you'll see where it lands. And it landed fairly close to me. What did it look like when it landed? How big is it? Like a spray paint can? Um, No, it's actually smaller. It's like a 12-ounce soda can. And it was smoking? Yeah, at the time it was uh, looked like fire. What did it feel like when you picked it up? It was was room temperature. It wasn't hot. It really didn't have a a distinctive, you know, feeling like to where if you touched, you know that, okay, this is not good. What did you do with it? I threw it out of the way. You threw it just out of the way or did you throw it? Which way did you throw it? I really didn't aim for a direction because I didn't have time to even think to where I was going to throw it. But did you throw it the way that it had come? Possibly did. And and so the way that it had come was where the police were? I mean, I guess you can say that. My name is Robert Cohen. I'm a staff photographer at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I've um, been in St. Louis for 16 years. I've been a photojournalist for about 30 years. Yeah, I kind of saw it unfolding. Some of the first pictures I shot was um, Ed reaching down for the canister. And as he's reaching down, the sparks are flying out of it, and he actually leaves his feet. He just kind of jumps out of the way because as he's, as he's reaching down, the sparks are starting to fly. And so he kind of jumps out of the way and then, and then reaches back down again and throws it. And, you know, I'm, at this point, I'm just trying to get things in focus. And Quite frankly, I'm looking at my watch because we have a potential headline in the newspaper the next morning, which was going to reflect something like a calm night in Ferguson. And here we are pushing midnight, and the whole night has changed radically. Robert hurried to his car to start to edit the photographs he'd taken of Ed. And Ed, who had no idea he'd been photographed, hurried to his friend's car to try to get out of there. 
the two men hadn't met, at least not yet anyway. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. After the tear gas was shot, my friend, she was like, OK, let's go. You know, it's getting, it's getting dangerous. Let's go. Ed ran through the crowds to his friend's car, which was parked in a nearby church parking lot. But police were right behind him. And they were, uh, they were yelling, stop. So I hurry up and I unlock the car and I lock the back as I got into the car. And now I'm on the passenger side. I tried to crawl over to the driver's side, but at that time, I can see now that the car is surrounded because I don't see the light anymore. And the car was basically rocking. They were all around the car and they were hitting it. And uh, I guess one officer bust the window and opened the door. One, then another officer grabbed me by the shirt and by the hair. And they swung me to the ground. Meanwhile, Robert was sitting in his car with his laptop, editing the photographs he'd taken of Ed, and rushing to get them to his editor before the newspaper's deadline. When you look at the series, we've got them up on our site, it's almost like a flip book. You can see Ed jumping over the burning gas canister on the ground, the space under his feet and legs illuminated by the sparks and smoke. Then you can see the moment where Ed reaches down with what looks like no hesitation and picks up the burning canister. Those pictures are powerful in their own right, to see a person grab this ball of fire. But it was one of the last pictures that Robert took that made him realize he'd captured something special. It's Ed, in a full baseball pitcher's stance. His body is arched backwards, his arms stretched out, and made bright by that burning can in his hand. I did not, you know, the, the, the symbolism that, that holds so strong in, the, in this image, with the exception of, you know, the act, the act of defiance and you know, fighting back and, you know, all, all the themes a lot of people talk about, it's held together by the fact that he's got an American flag shirt on. I did not see that shirt. I did not see that shirt while I was photographing. I, you know, all I see is a man come out of nowhere and pick up this canister and throw it back. And so I didn't actually appreciate, you know, that extra nugget until I was at my car whipping open my laptop, really trying to make deadline. Robert missed his deadline by just 15 minutes and went home. He decided to post the photo on his personal Twitter feed and went to bed. When he woke up, he knew something was going on. He had about 8,000 new Twitter followers. The photo had gone completely viral overnight and taken on a life of its own. Less than 48 hours after I shot this photo, I met the Michael Brown rem- Memorial, and a man shows up in a T-shirt with Ed's picture on it. And so I'm, I'm photographing this man at the memorial dressed in my picture which is bizarre. And, and since that point, there's been hundreds of things sent to me, things sent to Ed, in terms of the artist rendering. People will just, they, they decide they want to paint this picture and, for, and they have a need to send it to us. Two people, one in L.A., one I don't know where, had a tattooed on their body, uh, one on their shoulder, one on their bicep. Um, in New Orleans, there's a big art project and... Ed is four stories tall. It's amazing how people feel a need to to reproduce it. Not only has the photograph that Robert took of Ed become an iconic image of the Ferguson protests, it was also part of a group of photographs taken after the shooting of Michael Brown by photographers at the St. Louis Dispatch that would go on to win the Pulitzer Prize. You know, a lot of people see the image and they don't know it's me. But me knowing it's me and it's just, you know, I just sit back and think like, wow, they really appreciate this picture. And to, to some extent, I feel like, okay, well, they, appre- they appreciate me because they feel what I did was right. So I'm cool with that. On the one-year anniversary of Michael Brown's death this past August, People in Ferguson gathered once again for what started off, by all accounts, as a peaceful demonstration. On the night of the second day of protests, however, things escalated between the police and protesters once again. And Robert Cohen was back out there with his camera. 
the police came out very aggressively that night. And uh, they were moving protesters out of the street much more aggressively than they were before. Robert says he was standing with a group of protesters who had, for the most part, complied with the officers' requests and gotten out of the street and onto the sidewalk. But there was one protester that was still yelling at the officers pretty loudly. And the, the county officer just decided to arrest him. And, and instead of spraying him with pepper spray alone, he sprayed a pretty wide stream. And my body, my upper body was just drenched, my arms, my shirt, my hair. He had photographed a lot of people being tear-gassed and pepper-sprayed in Ferguson. But this was the first time he'd experienced it himself. I mean, everywhere it was touching me was burning. I mean, it, it, it's oil-based, which I did not know at the time. And so water only makes it worse. And I was carrying a, a separate lens in a little uh, fanny pack. And, it, and it, the lens jumped out of the fanny pack as I probably just kind of dove out of the way. And I went to reach for the lens to pick it up off the ground. And somebody else's hand grabs it before I grab it. And he says, are you okay? Are you okay? It's like, it's like uh, I, did, I didn't even see Ed, and I knew it was Ed. And look who's, look who's bending down to help me out. It was crazy. Ed was also at the protest. But this time, he was watching from a distance when he saw the police spray the crowd. And then he saw Robert. Almost exactly one year to the day, Robert and Ed met again. Ed, 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 Ed what, did he, what did Robert look like? Did he look like he was in bad shape? Yeah, he did. <laughs> he, looked like, he looked like he had left a confetti party. And it was um, silly string all over him, but I knew what it was. It was orange pepper spray. And uh, when it initially was shot, I, I seen that it got him right in the face. But I didn't know if he had got in his eyes. So, of course, you know, he's carrying thousands of dollars of equipment and at that time, he seemed very vulnerable to the typical snatch and grab, which was going on a lot down there that night. And I'd hate to see that happen to Robert. So, you know, I kind of tried to guide him out of the way, out of the crowd. And, you know, just make sure he was all right. And he did. You both have come into each other's lives at, at rather important times. Yeah, um, I, 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 I feel that is true. Because anytime I see him, he's always going to get, you know, he's always going to get hey, Robert, how you doing? How's it going? You know, he's he's always going to be acknowledged on my end. And, um, you know, that's just the utmost respect I have for him. But the complicated thing is that Robert's Pulitzer Prize-winning photo is also undeniable proof that Ed was the guy who threw that tear gas canister. I'm often asked, am I mad at him for taking that picture? You know, seeing that I'm facing charges and... No, I'm not mad. He he did an he did an amazing job, <laughs> and every time I see him, I make sure I show gratitude. You know, um, because whether he knows or not, he's he's changed my life. Ed's been charged with assault, and with repeatedly failing to comply with police. He had his first court appearance in September. is produced by Lauren Spohr and me. Audio engineering help from Rob Byers and Russ Henry. Julianne Alexander makes original illustrations for each episode of Criminal. She's also made a beautiful criminal calendar for 2016 with artwork and quotes from some of our favorite episodes. We've got that, along with some new t-shirts, up at thisiscriminal.com. Maybe a good idea for a holiday gift. And here's some trivia. I pack and ship it all myself. Criminal is recorded in the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. For this episode, we're also supported by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses at a fraction of the price. Casper's figured out a way to cut out the middleman and deliver the savings right to you. They sent me a Casper mattress a while ago, and the quality is just great. You can try it out and decide for yourself. They have a risk-free trial and return policy. Sleep on it for 100 days, and if you still don't like it, send it back. It's $500 for a twin-size mattress and $950 for a king. They ship it in this totally manageable box to your front door, so you could give someone a mattress for a present. I don't know if that's been done before, but this might be the moment. 
Right now, criminal listeners can get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash criminal and using promo code criminal at checkout. Criminal is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collective of the 13 best shows around. Shows like Mortified. Each week, the Mortified podcast features adults reading their most embarrassing adolescent writings out loud in front of total strangers. It's very funny. February 20th, 1991, 20th century. (laughs) Break. Incoming message. Kevin HQ Control. Alert, alert. Fire up generators. Begin flirt sequence. Mortified comes out every Monday. Go listen. Radiotopia from PRX is supported by the Knight Foundation and MailChimp, celebrating creativity, chaos, and teamwork. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.